Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm a compliance evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 88 of Compliance Into the Weeds, a podcast where with my good friend and colleague, Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance, we take a deep dive, literally going into the weeds for a compliance or compliance-related topic. Today, we take up the recent pronouncement, or rather announcement by the Securities and Exchange Commission of proposed changes to the whistleblower program uh, instituted for the SEC through the Dodd-Frank Act. The proposed changes include changes to the definition of whistleblower information, a cap on potential whistleblower claims, a raising of the floor of uh, minor or smaller amounts paid out. It's a fascinating exploration of the SEC rulemaking process and where it may lead the compliance practitioner in the future. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, back for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds, a podcast where my good friend and colleague, Matt Kelly, founder of Radical Compliance, we take a deep dive, literally going into the weeds of a compliance or compliance-related topic. Today, we're going to take a look at the proposed changes to the SEC whistleblower program. Matt's written about this with a uh, blog post entitled, SEC Starts Regulatory Reform Push. There was a lot of gnashing of teeth last week. But Matt, now that we've had the chance to uh, sort of read this, digest it, you've obviously written about it. I've been thinking about it. Uh, what to... Uh, I guess maybe you should lay the table and and maybe lay out some your some of your thoughts this week on it. Yeah, I, I go back and forth on how many of my teeth I want to devote to the gnashing. Um, here is what the SEC has proposed to do. Let's start with that. So a couple of major points. Um, most notable uh, is that they are going to propose a cap on whistleblower awards of no more than thirty million dollars. Uh, second. They're also going to try to expand their discretion to increase the size of smaller awards. Uh, As I understand it, the way it works is you submit uh, some information. Does it meet these criteria? Then you would get this much, 10 to 30 percent of whatever settlement the SEC gets. Well, if you do all of that, but 10 percent of it only amounts to like 45 grand, uh, 100,000, 400,000, the commission wants more discretion to push those small uh, awards up to $2 million so, so long as the $2 million isn't in excess of that 30% range. So it's a little bit of math you'd have to do there. But you know they are seeking to cap large awards while giving themselves more discretion to give more smaller awards or larger small awards. Um, They are clarifying that whistleblowers must provide their tips in writing. Uh, That is not a big change because already you have to submit your tips through an online form. But that was specifically to uh, clear up any confusion from the Supreme Court's ruling earlier this year, Digital Reality Trust v. Summers, which Tom, you and I have talked about that ruling that said if people want whistleblower protections under the Dodd-Frank Act, they must first report to the SEC. What does that mean? This is what it means. is You have to do it in writing so there's a record. Um, they did propose some changes to accelerate the summary dismissal of claims that probably were going to get dismissed anyways. Uh, They were frivolous. They're untimely. They're based on public information that anybody could have figured out. They're based on information the SEC was never really going to use anyways, stuff like that. But a way to speed up flushing frivolous or faulty complaints out of the system more quickly. Uh, And then there was also they're trying to tighten the eligibility for outsiders who bring independent analysis to the SEC. And when does that qualify as a whistleblower tip eligible for an award or not? The SEC was seeking to raise that bar. So that's, I think, five major things. There probably are more things. The proposed rules are 184 pages, um, but that's the, the highlights of how they're trying to reform the whistleblower program right now. So the um, the changes, as you mentioned, Matt, uh, w- at least one we could see in response to the digital uh, realty trust versus Summers case. But the one I wanted to focus on to start with that garnered the most 
publicity, at least last week, which in my mind may be the least significant, is the capping of the awards at $30 million. Yeah. Uh, now, that's uh, $30 million, That would be one-third of a total awarded to the SEC. So it would have to be something that a company agreed to pay of uh, $90 million or over. And uh, my first pass on this was that that is going to impact such a small number of uh, claimants that it's really not the the signature part of this proposed change. But you also pointed out that uh, it's unclear if the SEC can even do this under Dodd-Frank. And it, it, does this capping at any way, um, or is it negative towards the overall uh, whistleblower program or the office of the whistleblower? We, and th- that's the debate. And um, so Democratic appointee Kara Stein, she was the one when the SEC uh, p- put out this proposal and they put it out last week on a 3-2 party line vote. And Kara Stein, uh, she opposed it. She was the one who said she's not really sure the language of Dodd-Frank allows the SEC to do this. Now, I would take that as an interpretation for some pro whistleblower group out there to file a legal challenge to the final rules when they do come forward. Uh, Because we saw during the Obama administration, uh, generally conservative groups challenged all sorts of SEC rules put forward by the Democratic-led commission then. I think we might see a inverse run of that operation now. Um, But basically, the commission said that it wanted the discretion to be able to cap excessively large awards. Well, to my reading of the Dodd-Frank statute, it doesn't actually say that the SEC can do that. Um, And what is the compelling need for the SEC to have that discretion? Uh, If the goal is to foster whistleblowers, then you want basically to have as many of them feel comfortable coming forward as possible. Uh, You're absolutely right that How many whistleblower awards are we talking about of this size? Like a tiny, tiny number of them. Really, this was caused by a whistleblower award issued earlier this year that was a grand total of $83 million split among three people. Um, And that right there, that one single whistleblower award, I think accounted for one third of all of the money the commission has given out in the last seven years. Uh, And Now people are saying, Chairman Jay Clayton and his supporters are saying, that's too large. Um, You know, says who or why? Like, what harm is there to anybody that there are large awards? Uh, These awards do not come from the taxpayer. They do not come from the SEC budget, where the SEC is diverting money from some other operation to give somebody a huge handout. And it's worth thinking that, okay, these whistleblowers don't come along too often. However, the ones who do, you know, they're probably going to be senior level people who've got solid leads on some really bad stuff, because that is what leads to these gigantic SEC settlements. And as uh, Commissioner Robert Jackson was saying, and he was another Democratic appointee, like these people are risking not just their jobs, but possibly their whole careers by blowing the whistle on a massive fraud. And so they do need some sort of compensation and protection for stepping up like that. And even if the commission today treats all of this very carefully and judiciously, there isn't any safeguard in this proposal that future commissioners might really try to inject political favoritism or political objectives into this rule that we're not ever going to give any big awards, period, no matter what. Um, there's nothing here to say that that couldn't happen. And that would be a bad precedent for whistleblowers. So that's the one where like, you know, ugh, it's, it's not, it's not necessarily a good thing. Although there are other jurisdictions, um, Ottawa, uh, the uh, up in Ontario, the Ontario securities commission, they just put out a summary of their whistleblower program and Ontario is, uh, their whistleblower protection program of, allows awards only up to $5 million. That's going good. Canada's really not that different than the United States in many ways. Its securities market is a lot like ours. They do it. Is it really the end of the world that we would do it? Some people might say so, but there are examples where they do and the world hasn't ended. So that's where we are on that. 
Well, you left out the national security threat that Canada poses to the United States, which we have to factor into now. You know, the subtle stealth takeover of U.S. culture by Canadian comedians is a (laughs) subject for another day, but spot on. The uh, actually, Matt, the one that uh, concerned me the most was the SEC also issued guidance on what constitutes independent analysis. Uh, to so to qualify as an independent analysis, a whistleblower submission has to provide an evaluation, assessment, or insight beyond which would be readily apparent through the through public information. Uh, because I see this um, as a, a way to start cutting back on a uh, cottage industry that's arisen of um, Harry Mark Coppolis types that mm-hmm. uh, find a potential fraud analyze it themselves on public information, do the spade work, uh, and turn it in to the SEC. And in his case, of course, it got nowhere. It was around the Bernie Madoff fraud. But also, if we're going to encourage people to sort of self-police the industry, this seems like to me to be, uh, if not a giant step backwards, the beginnings of step backward. And I have mixed views on this because I agree 100 percent. This is an uh, effort to stifle that cottage industry of outside analysts trying to identify fraud and misconduct at a company. Um, that costs companies a lot of money. They do not like this. It, From their perspective, they would just see this as a scourge uh, that they'd like eradicated. doesn't matter that people like Henry Markopoulos actually were trying to do investors a huge favor by rooting out scam artists such as Bernie Madoff. Um On the other hand, people aren't wrong to make an argument that what these outsiders are doing isn't whistleblowing per se. Um, Whistleblowers under the statute, the Dodd-Frank statute, they clearly were intending to have employees who are aware of a scam at their organization uncover that and basically betray the fraudsters that they know about. Outside analysts don't have any loyalty to any fraudsters. They're not betraying them. They're taking them down. Are they fraud investigators? Yes. Are they worthwhile? Yes. Um, Are they also something that like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and other business groups would absolutely loathe because they're investing a lot of money to get a bigger payout later on? Yeah, you know, that's what they're doing. And so Jay Clayton, the SEC chairman, is trying to cut that off at the knees. I I don't know where to come down on this. You can make arguments on either side that, you know, how much does this have to do with whistleblower protection as the Dodd-Frank Act was trying to put forth? But it is what it is. I would say also that you're right that the language in the rule, like this is a really vague standard. And the SEC even says that. They admit this is not a bright line test. Well, yuck. Nobody wants to hear that. Um So, you know, if the SEC had its budget cut for whatever reason and they started using, I don't know, abacus and the paper spreadsheets and they couldn't uncover this fraud, does that mean that the threshold for independent analysis by people using whiz bang AI would would that be higher? But compared to today, when they are using a lot of high tech tools because they do have a lot of budget, you know, is there a different standard? Is there a different standard between one office and the next? Uh, Is there a different standard between one employee at the SEC who's investigating, who's really sharp, and another one who may be perhaps a bit more dull witted? Like, where do we define that? Um, Are we going to put out some sort of clear standards of what the SEC's ability to infer from public data? is. Uh, Right now, that's all unclear in the language of this rule. I'm sure the SEC wants it to be unclear so they can have more discretion, but that doesn't necessarily help the fraud investigators out there who, like I said, they're still doing a public good finding the fraud. Um, So that's a more complex issue to, to kind of parse out, I think. So one of uh, the articles I read, I think it was in the uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, Risk and Compliance Journal, uh, quoted several commentators who said that uh, there, of all of the uh, whistleblower statutes, uh, including in healthcare, including in um, obviously uh, tax uh, IRS statutes, there's one no limit, and two uh, there's uh, no um, sort of restrictions around those 
uh, third parties who might bring forward information indicating, if not fraud, a violation of the laws. So um, to me, it really sticks out like a very sore thumb that's about to get chopped off that Mm -hmm. uh, the SEC might do so. And in thinking through it in terms of the um, harassment and or uh, pain points to uh, the business community, this is a an entirely different system than shareholder litigation. Here you have people doing independent investigation, turning it over to the regulators for another level of review so that it's not simply a uh, uh, attempt to uh, get some uh, plaintiff's attorney's fees by filing a shareholder derivative action. So I'm obviously finding this a little more troubling than even the um, cap on the top uh, potential awards. You mentioned also the more for smaller settlements. Uh, do you think this was simply as a, a kind of a cynical political move, or does this really actually help the smaller uh, settlement or the person who brings the, the smaller issue forward? If I can get away with saying both, I would. Uh, I think it is a cynical political move to make it seem like we are spreading the wealth among more people who are aware of smaller frauds and making the whistleblowing of those smaller frauds more lucrative because you might get a bigger payout for a small fraud. Uh, But at the same time, yes, it does make it easier to say, well, but we are going to cap stuff at the top end because we've only had a handful of those cases in seven years anyways. And, you know, while we're doing that to bring other relief, we'll do this. Um, it's good to help people reporting small frauds. Most companies in the United States are small companies. Most publicly traded companies are small companies. Most of the frauds they deal with are small frauds that will not lead to large penalties. And so giving a bigger reward to people who are playing around in those smaller ponds, that's good, but it doesn't necessarily follow that we can also therefore trim off the larger frauds at the top, uh, which you know, really, if you're the CFO at a company that is committing, say, an Enron scale of fraud, you know, your career could be over by blowing the whistle on that misconduct. So I'm not necessarily saying that you are wrong to stand to inherit 50 or $60 million. It's a nice chunk of change. I'd like to get that myself. But if you are saving investors billions of dollars, then I don't necessarily know what the harm is. And that was the point that both Democratic commissioners made, uh, Commissioner Stein and Commissioner Jackson, said, show us that there is a need to do this, that something is broken in the whistleblower program that requires a cap. Um, You know, conservatives have often talked about the need for a good cost benefit analysis uh, of any new rule. Well, what is the, the cost and the benefit here? I mean, Like Commissioner Stein said, this doesn't cost the taxpayers of the SEC a dime. And so, like, what is pushing this other than simply capping that uh, whistleblower litigation industrial complex that's out there? And just because it sounds like it's a little bit skeezy and there probably are some skeezy players who do that, that doesn't mean that they're all skeezy. And ratting out misconduct is not a bad thing. And that's uh, that's really a great way to to put a uh, cherry on the uh, whipped cream of this chocolate sundae. Um, mm-hmm. Do you know the uh, review process that will uh, we will go through for this? Is this are these proposed regulations that are now open for public comment, or is this uh, uh, after a thirty day period they become uh, the new regulatory interpretations by the SEC? Yep. They are open for public comment for 60 days after publication in the Federal Register, which as of uh, Tuesday morning, July 3rd, had not yet happened. But uh, they probably will be published in the Federal Register within days. Safe to say that they will be out for comment over the summer. And then in theory, the SEC could adopt final rules sometime in September. They might revise them. They might put them out for more public comment. Uh, They might take their sweet time with this. Um, We would have to see. But, you know, in theory, these changes could come into effect sometime um, within, I don't know, by the end of the year. We'll, We'll definitely see more sometime this fall. It will be interesting to see how these rule changes might play out as 
the political landscape changes in Congress over the fall, and if Commissioner Clayton is looking at a Democratic takeover uh, in Congress, then he'd have to deal with them. How would he try and do this or not? We don't know. Um, the only other point that I would want to make about these rules overall for compliance officers specifically, like what is your primary interest here? Your interest is that the culture of whistleblowing is fostered, supported, and therefore you are not necessarily caught up in the nuance of how much of an award might a whistleblower get. Whistleblowers, from your perspective as the CCO, is are these people protected from retaliation? Um, which was a jump ball for a while after that Supreme Court ruling. And therefore, you know, we always have to remember the vast majority of tips that come into the SEC, even if they're legitimate, they don't get any awards. So we have to think about those 99%. And it's more about do they know how to claim whistleblower protection status under the law? And this is what the, these regulations help with that. Do they know or will they be able to get a clear, easy answer that no, they're not protected, which is something else a whistleblower should want to know as soon as possible. And this is trying to help with that. So in that small respect about trying to foster a culture of whistleblowing and protection for whistleblowers, these proposed rules do help with that. Now, as to the awards and would changes in the awards eclipse all of the benefits that the protections are trying to you know, put forward here, you know, are we going to lose that because we're so caught up in fights over awards and outside analysis? I don't know. But compliance officers have to keep their eye on one ball. How do we convince whistleblowers that they're going to be protected if they speak up? And that is something that these rules try and get a good answer on. So that would seem like a great place to uh, to end this podcast, Matt. Uh, I've been visiting with Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance. We've been looking at the proposed changes to the SEC whistleblower pro program. Matt, until next week. All right. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you have any questions, you can email Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. You can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Compliance Into the Weeds is cross-posted on several different platforms. If you have listed on, listened to us on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would give us a rating or a review as it would help in our ratings and help get the word out about this most unique compliance podcast. Thanks again for listening to us this week, and I hope you'll join us again next week where Matt and I take another deep dive into the weeds of a compliance topic. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.